Okay, so the topic of my presentation is searching for loops and samples with feature learning. And it's a, a research problem uh, formulated uh, directly in response to uh, a business demand uh, from uh, a studio that's making video games and uh, wanted to have something for uh, annotation of sounds, uh, for finding interesting sounds, but uh, it's not the type of video game that uh, automatically makes it uh, uh, when user does it, like when, when the player supplies uh, a song, because uh, there exists video games that like that, but this is not what we're talking about. Uh, we are talking about the production stage uh, where uh, uh, the company is working with a pre-existing music track, right? And they want to have a simpler way uh, to make uh, things like their visual effects sync with uh, some interesting sound that repeats in the song. So that was the goal, and the goal was basically just to minimize the user effort uh, in searching uh, for sounds. So you mark a sound excerpt uh, from a song, uh, you try to find uh, similar places in the song, and you just want to do it uh, in a way that minimizes the effort. And the data availability is certainly low. Uh, we weren't supplied with many of uh, the uh, actual in-house sounds from the company. Uh, for the evaluation, to make the evaluation in any way meaningful, uh, we have to create our own data set. Um, and this is a surprisingly hard problem. Uh, it's seems very simple to just search for similar sounds, uh, seems even trivial, uh, but it becomes slightly harder when uh, we actually take it upon ourselves to minimize that user effort, right? So the user doesn't have to supply like annotated data set of what he finds uh, to be an interesting sounds and just can do it by marking one example and then searching for something like this. Uh, so uh, we opted for active learning uh, a sort of user in the loop solution and typically when we read active learning papers uh, it's about this uh, kind of uh, model where we have the loop uh, between uh, a machine learning model uh, our data pool we supply data to the annotator uh, we label the data, data and then we train a better model, hopefully. And the whole point of active learning is usually to uh, select the best kind of unlabeled data so that it uh, improves uh, the machine learning model performance the most on the next loop, right? Uh, and this is the case uh, for our task because we want uh, the user to just respond to what the system returns to them. Uh, and then improve the model based on that. Uh, but there are slight differences uh, at the way we, in the way we are evaluating it, because uh, in the end we want that active part to happen at the usage stage, right? So the uh, usage scenario would be that the user just marks. Uh, one particular sound, right? Uh, I want to search for something like this. And the user gets the, return, the results and then uh, decides whether these results uh, are good uh, and uh, gets new results, right? Without uh, retraining a, a full large scale model uh, based on these uh, replies, right? So it can happen at the actual user stage. And um, ideally, we want to start with just a single sample um, to minimize the effort, and we want the limit to be uh, not in the number of annotation, because uh, active learning usually uses uh, some sort of annotation budget, uh, right? Uh, how much can we annotate uh, on each of uh, those loops? Uh, but in the number of uh, mistakes uh, that this system can make before the user loses their patients. Um, and we automated the evolution uh, in the heuristic way where uh, simply if there is sufficient overlap between uh, what's annotated in the data set uh, and what got returned, this is uh, considered uh, a correct uh, 
uh, result, right? Because uh, we don't evaluate it uh, mm, like completely with the user. Uh, we eva want to have uh, some sort of uh, automated evaluation uh, where we can test it uh, automatically. Uh, so what we do, we prepare uh, an annotated set, right? But uh, we don't use that data set uh, at all for training. Uh, we just use it to uh, determine whether the behavior of the system is uh, correct uh, at the evaluation stage and uh, to uh, say whether uh, a real user in case of that response would say that response was good. Uh, right, so that's uh, how it uh, sort of looks when uh, described algorithmically. Uh, all right, so we have uh, a retrieval function that starts with a set of positive uh, examples in just a single example and an empty set of negative examples, right? And we continue this uh, loop of uh, returning examples uh, until the size of the set of negative examples uh, grows to the user's patience. Mm. Uh, and the evaluation data set we created for this task uh, um, is not uh, particularly large, but it's also, I think, uh, decently sized for the type of annotation we use. Uh, it's used, uh, it uses electronic music only, uh, it uses fully uh, royalty free music so uh, that it could be shared without uh, uh, copyright problems. Uh, and uh, the data set contains 300 full tracks, uh, so that uh, comes to 18 hours of music uh, with uh, 0.1 precision annotations. Uh, with the key categories of the sounds we want to search for and uh, being described as loops and samples, uh, it's important to point out that we uh, don't really uh, define these terms in uh, very exactly, uh, because uh, it's, it's not really possible to differentiate them exactly because in electronic music there are looping sounds, uh, right? Loops uh, that uh, sort of form the baseline of an electronic music track. Uh, there are uh, reused samples where uh, some particular sound uh, is just uh, sort of copied and pasted into the track. Uh, but uh, loops can be samples and samples can be loops. Um, Mm, however, these were the two sort of key types of sounds that uh, that our business partner uh, described to us as what we would like to retrieve. So we decided to use this categorization and we just uh, simply related to the annotators, describing it in this way that loops are the uh, sort of sounds that actually uh, repeat and loop seamlessly and uh, form the base on, on of the tracks and samples would be the uh, some unique special sound effect that they find interesting uh, and it sort of stands out against the background, right? Um, and the deep learning part uh, uh, is relevant here because uh, this is sort of the uh, key uh, part of the current research and um, how to improve this uh, uh, approach to retrieving sounds with deep learning. Uh, and deep learning is an obviously con choice in uh, basically every machine learning field uh, now, uh, and uh, it allows us to use large un unannotated data sets, uh, uh, large music collections uh, for the purpose of our problem where we have uh, limited data. Uh, and in low resource problems, uh, that's not limited to music, that's also in measures, that's also in language. Uh, always what tends to be the key is some form of unsupervised uh, representation learning. So that's what we went with. Um, and uh, with unsupervised representation learning, uh, the classic method for neural network uh, would be an, some form of autoencoding network where we have an encoder part, decoder part. Uh, we essentially uh, want to create a compact representation uh, and uh, 
we want to then retrieve the full data from that compact representation. Uh, so we hope that the compact representation is uh, uh, better uh, for representing uh, the actual patterns of the data. Uh, but the big thing recently, uh, recently is uh, contrastive learning. Uh, the idea that uh, we can train unsupervised models uh, by simply augmenting data uh, in sufficiently different ways uh, where data is compared uh, with its own augmented version uh, and we sort of turn it uh, on these uh, similar dissimilar pairs, right? Uh, we have similar pairs, uh, pairs created uh, from the same data augmented uh, differently and these similar pairs are just completely different data. And this turns out to be uh, really good uh, as a way of uh, unsupervised learning uh, and uh, recently um, it becomes uh, a very good alternative to uh, autoencoding just. Uh, so um, this is the picture of uh, from the paper bootstrap to your, your own latent which uh, was uh, one of the recent methods uh, for contrasted learning right uh, so what we see here is that we uh, take the same input data. This was done on, on images, but it really works uh, just as well for music. Uh, we create two views where two views uh, are uh, just two different augmentations of the same data. Right? We, we have a trainable uh, representation method. Uh, so that would be just uh, some form of a a neural network that uh, usually will reduce the dimensionality and try to convert it to uh, some sort of data vector uh, rather than a full tensor like an image or a, a spectrogram of a musical piece. Um, and then there are additional projections or prediction layers before the actual comparison uh, gets made. Uh, uh, these are actually uh, not required. These are uh, these were found found to improve uh, performance, but they are not actually mandatory for the approach to work. Right. The key part is that uh, we create two different views and compare the representations. But if after uh, creating a representation, we also have a projection layer that uh, simply uh, reprojects the, the data to a different space. And maybe a prediction layer that uh, uh, compares uh, one uh, of these branches of the network to the other. Uh, this is found to just uh, empirically found to improve results, but these are not uh, completely required uh, for the approach to work. Uh, Uh, so, uh, to summarize the full method, uh, it's a user in the loop retrieval where user gets uh, uh, prompted uh, to answer whether the last answer were correct, was correct or not, and based on that, uh, the next answers are generated. generated. Uh, features are derived from a feature learning network that uh, uses a contrastive learning objective. Uh, which is combined with uh, autoencoder objective because we actually found that one of those two uh, just performs worse if we choose one. Uh, that's simply combining them. And you can combine them uh, without an issue, without an, uh, within a, a neural network, right? Because uh, all we have to do is simply to sum the losses. Uh, Meeting uh, auto encoder objective and contrastive uh, objective, and uh, adds uh, an additional branch to the network for the contrastive objective. Uh, but they can be uh, combined without an issue. Uh, and within the created feature space, uh, what we've used so far, uh, what performed best so far, was simply just uh, nearest neighbor search. <clears throat> So the results, uh, we found that uh, uh, first, uh, compared to results without, this is not listed here, but without active learning, this, uh, uh, this wasn't really solvable. Uh, like, uh, 
Uh, I'm not showing uh, results without active learning here, but without active learning, they were about 20% worse, so they were just uh, unusable. Um, but uh, and the feature learning uh, added in this paper improves the results uh, for of uh, over a few percent uh, over standard features uh, and has uh, more significant uh, advantages in specific general subset uh, of the data. And there was no general subset uh, of the data where performance dropped, so that uh, seems to indicate we should uh, stick with uh, feature learning uh, for this. And uh, this is uh, an example of an actual comparison um, from the paper uh, between feature learning uh, and uh, a classical representation of uh, audio, which was uh, mel frequency substrate coefficients, uh, that uh, sort of the common representations of uh, audio uh, used uh, before uh, the domination of deep networks started. Um, and these uh, aren't uh, some sort of uh, huge performance gains, but they are uh, kind of almost free and because uh, all the uh, additional costs uh, are incurred uh, at the training time. So as long as we can have a uh, a good uh, feature extraction network start somewhere. Uh, we just get better results by replacing uh, classical features with the uh, learned features. Uh, and we can see that there's uh, certainly a, a difference uh, between uh, improvements in different genres. Uh, none of them drops uh, is what's important. Um, <clears throat> uh, the summary of our results would be that loops are definitely easier to retrieve than uh, interesting samples. And that's probably because the idea of an interesting sample is uh, highly subjective uh, and will be different for uh, every user. And uh, perhaps the way to move forward here is uh, some form of model personalization, and but that's in the future. Contrastive learning uh, alone com uh, Mm, went much worse than combined with autoencoder. The good result from feature learning uh, came through combination of uh, different modes of feature learning, uh, not just one method. And uh, for contrastive learning itself, uh, because contrastive learning requires uh, some form of augmentation to compare data with itself, uh, what worked best was just a mix of a uh, variety of different uh, augmentation of sound. So adding noise, uh, erasing parts of the uh, spectrogram. Uh, we tried uh, as something more fancy uh, to use uh, harmonic, percussive, uh, harmonic percussive separation and compare uh, the sound with uh, its only its percussive part or only its melodic part, um, but that actually wasn't as good. Um, and really, it's just uh, a mix of different augmentation that uh, mostly add noise to the uh, to the sound. Uh, uh, so the final conclusions would be that uh, user in the loop uh, is very important for this problem uh, is key. Uh, as I said, uh, without user in the loop, this uh, gave us uh, just unusable results. Uh, deep feature learning uh, boosted performance uh, without uh, any additional annotation effort is a good way to use uh, the large annotated uh, data and that are available always. Uh, and uh, the future direction for development, I would say, is how to apply the active learning, the user in the loop part. Uh, to the feature space, because uh, right now we simply ask the feature, the user, uh, whether samples are uh, positives or negatives, uh, right, and then use it basically for a nearest neighbor algorithm. Uh, but perhaps there is uh, a way to use that uh, active response to change the feature space. Uh, this is problematic with uh, deep learning, though, because uh, we obviously can't uh, retrain uh, a deep model at the evaluation space, uh, at the evaluation time. Uh, so this is uh, an ongoing problem. Uh, okay, that would be my presentation. Uh, thank you very much.
Thank you very much. Uh, we have time only for a very quick question. Maybe just a quick one. Uh, so finally, uh, ha have your business partner, the, the game development studio, used this method or plans on using it? Were, were they happy with the results? Uh, well, uh, as far as uh, I know, uh, they have used it uh, for whether they were happy with the results. Uh, <laughs> I mix mean, back. I would say, um, but uh, it's uh, sort of they didn't give uh, us m much feedback uh, on where uh, where it performs good, where it uh, performs bad, right? So there were some right. uh, we like the, we kind of like it. We uh, it uh, doesn't always work, but uh, that there wasn't. Uh, right, enough communication back on where it doesn't work. Mm -hmm, but um, they have used it, so nice to hear. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you.